Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester, joined as always by Mike Tagliere. We're on Twitter, at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, my voice is uh, is recovering. It's still not all the way back. You losing to me in Top Golf, you'll never recover from that. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people said, um, you know, that's like basically running the ball in from the one yard line. It's like it's available to you, and maybe I was wrong in that. Maybe I should have been chipping as well. So I'll take the L. Here's the thing is, even if you were chipping, I still would have whooped you because I've played golf with you. And when you chip it, you like hit it into the woods behind the hole because you're a powerhouse. <laughs> no, my short game is not uh, the strength of my game. I will say that. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I'm taking a loss there. But fortunately, I don't have to dye my mustache blonde. So You're right about that. And uh, we're trying to figure out when that's going to happen. The mustache really isn't coming in as quickly as I expected. So it's looking a little embarrassing. Went to Walmart last night. Everyone was staring at me. I mean, they usually do, but in uh, you know a, b- a better way than what is that thing on your face? But we're getting there. You guys will all get to see when it gets dyed. Uh, I'm going to go into public with a blonde mustache. So hopefully you all enjoy that. It's going to be on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash fantasy pro. So you can check that out. Tags, here's what we have planned for today's show. And I really like this. We've never done anything like this before. So the NFL draft is over and, um, you know, people are going to be starting their dynasty rookie mock drafts. We figured we'd do some kind of mock. We didn't want to do it on, on draft simulator just because, you know, it's only four or five rounds. How quick is that episode going to be like 12, 12 minutes, right? Tags. So yeah, yeah. We'd make like four picks and then we'd be done. That's right. So tags and I are each going to make 12 picks here. And what we're going to do is I'm going to pick. Tags is going to pick, and then we're going to do the two next highest in ECR. ECR is expert consensus rankings. So we've got like 30 experts who have changed their dynasty rookie rankings since the draft ended, and that gives us a consensus, an expert consensus. So we'll take the top two, and then we'll go back again, and we'll make some picks. So Tags, let's just jump right into it, man. Do you want the first or second pick? I'll take the second pick. All right, so I'm going to go with Nikhil Harry then, and I think you probably would have gone with Josh Jacobs. Um, so you knew he would drop anyway. So you're going to get the second and third pick, or would you have gone with Harry? I would not have gone with Harry. I wish I would have taken the third pick now because I have Josh Jacobs and David Montgomery as my one and two. I mean, I understand that because they're going to contribute right away. I think Harry will as well. He's more raw than those guys are. He's a wide receiver, but playing with Brady for a couple of years is going to be helpful. They don't have much competition in New England. I just like wide receivers more because their lifespan is more than three or four years at best for a running back. You know, every once in a while you get one of these guys who plays six or seven. But, you know, I would expect Jacobs to have three good years. Montgomery to have three good years. Harry's probably going to be good for seven or eight years. Well, that's the crazy thing is that, so Nikhil Harry, like I wasn't a huge, huge fan before the draft. And I know that a lot of people are talking about him being the one, one, and I understand it, but wide receivers technically, like they usually don't just walk into the, the league and produce right away. And so it usually takes, you know, it's like a learning curve. There's a, there's a reason they call it third year wide receivers because they typically break out at that age. So if Tom Brady is ending his career while Nikhil Harry is supposed to be blooming and blossoming, we don't know who the quarterback's going to be. We do we think it's Jared Stidham? I don't know if that if he's the long term answer or not. But Nikhil Harry, he doesn't come without question marks. So with those one and two picks, I want someone who is locked in to be on the field, provided he's not hurt. Someone that's going to produce. And Josh Jacobs uh, and, and David Montgomery, those guys, you could flip flop them, whatever you want. But I'm going to go with Josh Jacobs at number two. With Isaiah Crowell, you know, being out for the season, I don't know if y'all heard that he tore his Achilles. His career is probably over at this point. He'll probably try to return. It's not going to happen, I would imagine. Josh Jacobs is suddenly a high third round pick in redraft leagues. Nikhil Harry, we're probably looking at what ninth, tenth round. Yeah, I, I think some people will reach for him just because they they believe that rookies produce more often. But I, I did an article on this that said what are rookies worth in fantasy football and wide receivers? They always go higher than they should uh, in terms of their rookie year production. So I mean, there's outliers here and there, but I just don't think Nikhil Harry is that guy. Yeah. Okay. That's totally fair. And, you know, I would say this, if your league is not deeper, if you're not starting three running backs, four wide receivers, two flex, I agree. I would go with Jacobs, but most of the dynasty leagues I play in are that deep because it's more skill. And I would rather have someone like Harry, who I think will be a fantasy starter for more than a handful of seasons. With that said, if this was a super flex draft tags, I'd be taking Kyler Murray one, one without a doubt. Are you with me? Yeah, I am with you on that one. Uh, he basically isn't going to have competition for that job. And I know Kingsbury came out today and said that, you know, he'll compete for the starting job, which is a bunch of crap. It's just stupid. I hate Coach Speak, man. Can they just tell us the truth? Yeah, they moved on from Josh Rosen. They can't do the same thing again with Kyler Murray. So even if he doesn't pan out and even if he's a bust, they're not going to draft a quarterback next year. So you're going to get two years at a Kyler Murray minimum uh, and a super flex. And he's going to add rushing totals like we saw Lamar Jackson last year. He wasn't a good quarterback in terms of like passing the ball, but he put up enough fantasy points. So in a two quarterback league, yeah, I 
would take Kyler Murray probably as the one one. Yeah. Um, Lamar Jackson, by the way, he had seven starts. How many rushing yards did he have? 700? Ridiculous. Uh, Kyler Murray, I think, is a better runner than uh, than Lamar Jackson. I'm not saying he's going to have 1,000 rushing yards, but 700? Yeah, I think that's a lock. I think it's possible. Like, I think I think I would lock him in if he played all 16 games for 600 at least, and that's obviously something that's good for fantasy. So, Yep. All right. So ECR takes Miles Sanders at number three, David Montgomery at number four, and that brings me up. And the top players on the board, DK Metcalf, A.J. Brown, Paris Campbell, Marquise Brown, who's not going to play very much this year, I would imagine, Debo Samuel. Um, those are the only ones I would actually consider. But this one's easy for me because Paris Campbell's my number three in my rankings for dynasty rookie drafts. I just see him coming into Indianapolis, not having too much in the way of competition. And Andrew Luck is going to get his fantasy points. You better believe if they spend a second round pick on Paris Campbell, he's going to be involved early and for a long time. Yeah, looking at the draft boards and like seeing the wide receivers that were available last year when the Colts had three second round picks and then looking at this year when they had all these picks, it's like, you know, we heard that the scouts liked Paris Campbell an awful lot and that Frank Reich loved him. He was so excited when they got Campbell in the draft. I don't know if you saw the video. I did. I did see the video. And that's the thing. Paris Campbell, I believe that he's going to be a fantastic fit in that offense. I think with his 4-3 speed and T.Y. Hilton on the field at the same time, it creates massive problems for a defense. So it's it's tough to figure it out just because you have the tight ends over the middle of the field who Andrew Luck has like really leaned on throughout his career but now that you have Campbell a guy that's like a weapon after the catch it's like they're going to be using on some underneath stuff and he's going to run after the catch so I like Paris Campbell but unfortunately he's not the number one option in his offense and you know when you get in the red zone he's he's probably the number three or four behind Eric Ebron and Devin Funches for now we'll see eventually T.Y. Hilton's going to go away and I think Campbell surpasses him and becomes Andrew Luck's number one into Andrew Luck's 30s. And assuming he can stay healthy, a lot of quarterbacks play better into their 30s. Someone asked me before the, the NFL draft, who is going to be my 1-1? One, one? I said, well, it kind of depends on landing spot, right? I would say probably whoever the Colts take at wide receiver in the second round. And I was thinking it was going to be Nikhil Harry or DK Metcalf, AJ Brown. Turns out it's Paris Campbell, so he's not my 1-1. One, one, but this is a perfect landing spot, and I've got him 1-3. So who are you taking? Metcalf, Brown, Brown? Hawkinson? I'm good with that pick, but I'm going to go with the next guy on my board that you passed over, and that's DK Metcalf. And, uh, you know, his slide in the NFL draft actually helped his fantasy stock because there's a lot of teams that he could have gone to that would have been, you know, a negative for, I mean, I wouldn't have liked him going to Baltimore, uh, but going to Seattle to play with Russell Wilson, this was one I had to like think about because, you know, when he fell in the draft, it's like, okay, I should lower him because NFL teams were obviously lower than the fantasy analysts or draft analysts were on DK Metcalf, but going to play with Russell Wilson, finding out about Doug Baldwin, potentially not playing another down in the NFL, Tyler Lockett, you know, he's, he's a little dude. Uh, he's not going to see 120 targets in a season, you know, even though he was efficient last year, he's just not that guy. Well, he's also his touchdown efficiency is going to go way down there's no chance it stays up oh 100 percent. that's like the easiest thing to predict this year but dk metcalf you know he comes into the nfl a little bit raw he's not a, a polished wide receiver but that's fine he's the only one on that roster right now that presents number one wide receiver upside and when you're playing with someone like russell wilson you know they, they're, they're moving into the second year in the offense and you're going to slowly see those pass attempts increase over years i do this article every single year talking about what does what do coaching changes mean for fantasy players and when you have a head coach and an offensive coordinator in place you know they remain in place on average those teams typically pass about 20 times more and if we drop doug baldwin off that target total all of a sudden there's a bunch of targets targets wide open. They didn't draft a tight end. I just think it means David Moore, man. And I, I don't know if you saw this post on my Twitter yesterday. So far, I've got 100% exposure to David Moore in best ball leagues. And I hope that continues because he's going to be the man in Seattle. I think he's going to be their number one. He's the most talented wide receiver on their roster, like in terms of polish. And he's finally going to get all the all the snaps. I think he gets targets. And I think, you know, Russell Wilson's going to get his. I love David Moore this year. David Moore, I mean, I I think that he's an interesting best ball target, but DK Metcalf's the most talented. Like Most talented. Yeah, I said it wrong. I'm sorry. The most ready to produce this year, I think, is David Moore. That's possible, and he's been in the offense for a year. Uh, but then they drafted Gary Jennings in the fourth round, too. So I don't know how they feel about David Moore. It could be just this whole Doug Baldwin thing, and they feel like, you know, Tyler Lockett's probably going to move to the slot full-time. Or Tyler Lockett's injury-prone. Like, if he gets hurt, what do you do? You've got DK Metcalf and David Moore, and that's it? No, you got to get another guy. Right, yeah. So, I mean, that's why I'm taking Metcalf here. I, I actually moved Metcalf up. Right after the draft, I had him at number seven, and I've moved Metcalf up to number five. Uh, you know, after thinking about it long and hard, it's just I feel better about Metcalf. I just know the potential, and it's like I like Campbell. I like Marquise Brown. I like A.J. Brown, but I'm looking at the guy who's got the best quarterback. He has the potential number one role, and these other guys are behind other guys in the depth chart. So it's like I'll take D.K. A week ago. 
DK Metcalf was number one on dynasty rankings, right? So this, I don't have a problem with this pick whatsoever. If Paris Campbell wasn't there, I would have taken Metcalf. ECR is going to go ahead and take the Brown boys, AJ Brown and Marquise Brown. So that moves us on to pick number nine, which I have Debo Samuel, TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant. I'm taking Miko Hardman because he's playing with Patrick Mahomes and Tyree Kill's going to be gone. I don't understand why he's sitting at number 12 in ECR. I've got him all the way up at number eight tags. I, there's a lot of people like that I respect in the industry who are ranking him in like their top three. Wow. I had not seen that. I believe opportunity matters, but I'm also not completely sold on Hardman as a player. Like I don't, he's kind of one dimensional, right? He's not just a field stretcher. He can do a little bit more than that. Um, but that's primarily what he is, but he's playing with Patrick Mahomes. I know, but the thing is, is I, I think people are just like expecting someone to walk into Tyreek Hill's role and then all of a sudden produce, and I'm not one of those guys. Like, I think Tyreek Hill is like an outlier. Well, he's not going to be a wide receiver one. Is he going to be a wide receiver three? Yeah, I would bet money on it. As a rookie, he's a wide receiver three. The reason that you want to attach your name to Hardman is because he does play for Andy Reid, because he is attached to Patrick Mahomes, because Sammy Watkins is injury prone himself. Like, he's got a lot of foot issues. Um, So it's like, if, if Sammy Watkins gets hurt again, it's like all of a sudden, who are we throwing the ball to? I mean, Travis Kelsey's still there. You have the running backs, but I'm fine with Hardman at the end of the first round. I mean, I could understand taking him over someone like Debo Samuel, but over the guys like Paris Campbell, like DK, I don't see that. Yeah, no, definitely not for me. So is that who you would have taken here if I didn't? Hardman? No. Yeah. Okay. So who are you taking? Uh, With my pick, it's Riley Ridley. No, I'm going to go with TJ Hawkinson. Looking at the wide receivers, like, so, you know, the, the receivers here, it's like Debo Samuel, Hakeem Butler. Those are the ones that I think I would like contemplate, but Debo Samuel now going to San Francisco. He's got Jalen Hurd, who was drafted the round after him. And then he's got Dante Pettis, who is arguably like just as complete a receiver. He can play all over the field. Both of these guys do that. And I think they limit each other's upside. And I just feel like it's an offense that you're just not going to see a lot of consistent production out of those guys. And I don't think Debo Samuel was ever a guy that was going to blow the top off fantasy either. So I feel like he's a fine player, but I'm not, I don't feel, I don't feel like there's a a ceiling with him. Whereas TJ Hawkinson, I feel like there's a ceiling with him. There's a chance he's the tight end one someday. Yeah, but I, I unfortunately, I'm not even super high on Hawkinson. I'm just taking him here because I didn't like anybody else, but I'm not super high on him just because, like, think about it. Eric Ebron, when he was in Detroit, he was known as someone who didn't or couldn't score touchdowns. And, you know, he leaves and all of a sudden he scores a lot of touchdowns. You know, Matthew Stafford has just never used his tight end a whole lot. So that's my only concern. But when they draft him number eight overall, I have to say that they're going to incorporate him into their offense. They did with Ebron too, though, man. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I I like Hawkinson a lot. That's who I would have picked if Hardman wasn't on the board. Um, and so ECR right now, they're going to take Debo Samuel and they're going to take Noah Fant, which moves us on to number 13, um, which on the board is Hakeem Butler, JJ Sega Whiteside, Kyler Murray, Daryl Henderson. And if, if Daryl Henderson wasn't there, I would reach here for Irv Smith Jr. because I don't think he's going to be that much worse. I mean, he's not going to play right away with Kyle Rudolph there. He's going to be on the field some, probably a little more than Dallas Goddard, maybe not get all the touchdowns that Goddard got as a rookie. So he's not going to be super useful right away. But when Kyle Rudolph's gone, I think Irv Smith Jr. is as crafted for fantasy football as TJ Hawkinson is. So I wouldn't mind taking him whatsoever with pick 12. That's where I've got him in my rankings. I do have Daryl Henderson a little bit higher, though. Um, You know, if they're drafting him this high, they've got to be worried about Todd Gurley. And I get it. Malcolm Brown is still there as well. Who knows if Henderson's the direct backup? But there is a huge upside with Daryl Henderson. I would say maybe more than anybody else in the draft. Would you say that that's fair just because they've got Sean McVay and Daryl Henderson becomes a workhorse in Sean McVay's offense? He's going to be a top five fantasy football player. And I'm looking up at the draft. Nikhil Harry, never going to be top five. Josh Jacobs, uh, probably not in Oakland. I'm, I'm not seeing that. David Montgomery, nah. Miles Sanders, DK Metcalf. I guess Metcalf has that type of upside, but more than anyone, I think it's Daryl Henderson. Daryl Henderson was an interesting pick for me. Uh, I, I didn't like the pick necessarily, but it might tell us something about Todd Gurley that we don't know. But trading up in the third round and taking him at the, at the top of the third round at that, it strikes me as odd because Henderson is not the type of running back that I thought that Sean McVay would like. I mean, he can catch passes. He can be a workhorse, even though he's a little bit smaller, but he's a very, you know, a uh, feast or famine running back, like an all or nothing. And that's, that's just really weird. I thought that McVay would want someone who's like, you know, someone who's a bit more downhill, you know what you're getting every single play, like Todd Gurley. And 
Henderson I just don't feel like is that. I don't know what they're doing in L.A. right now. You know, the whole matching an offer sheet for Malcolm Brown. You know, Todd Gurley, you know, walking with a limp on TMZ videos. Like, I don't know what to believe right now. But if we're reading in between the tea leaves here and the fact that they traded up to take Daryl Henderson, he's probably one of the best handcuffs in all of fantasy football. But that's what exactly what he is, though. And so I just want to say this, Bobby. I, I'm OK with this pick because you're picking for the, the number 13 overall pick in our draft. And that means it is the team who had the first overall pick. And that means you're a team that's probably not competing right now. So you're building for the future. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that pick because you're not necessarily looking for someone that's going to contribute to your team like right now, because you're probably a couple of years away from contending. You're right. And I don't know what the Rams are doing, but I know that I'm buying a lottery ticket because Henderson has all that upside. Um, I'm excited to see what happens. You know, I wrote recently in uh, an article on betting pros. If you guys haven't seen betting pros yet, all these sports books are starting to, uh, you know, develop in New Jersey and they're figuring out Pennsylvania, West Virginia. It's coming. Um, so you guys can check out bettingpros.com. We're talking about all these sites and everything like that. And I wrote up a spot in a featured pros article where it was asking, you know, who would you bet on for rookie of the year? Daryl Henderson was plus 3,000. That means you bet 100, you win 3,000. So 30 to 1 odds, Henderson's the rookie of the year. Yeah, he's not starting right away, but you know what? Running backs get hurt, and especially Todd Gurley. We don't know what's happening there. The average running back has like a 1 in 3 chance of getting hurt for a three-game uh, stretch throughout the year, and you would assume Gurley's quite a bit higher. So, you know, if it was, if you were to say Todd Gurley has a 1 in 30 chance of going down for the year, and then Daryl Henderson would fill in. Henderson would be the rookie of the year. I don't even think it's even close. So that's the bet I'm making. That's, I mean, it's interesting. I, I just don't know where Malcolm Brown fits in. If he's like the guy that they would ask to fill that role um, just because they retained him. Kind of like Justin Jackson in Los Angeles for last year, right? We were so excited about him. And then Austin Eckler got all the carries. Yeah, he did for a week. And then they realized eh, he's probably not fit for that job. And then, you know, Justin Jackson looked better doing it. So, yeah. All right, so who are you taking? I'm going to take the number 10 player on my board, and that is Hakeem Butler. Interesting. I've got him down at 18, man. I'm excited to hear what you have to say here. I Yeah, I have him over Andy Isabella, and I know Isabella was taken two rounds before Hakeem Butler, and he's on the same exact team. I understand that, but I think it's about the player and, like, what the potential is with him. Like, I don't think either of these guys are, like, guaranteed studs. I don't think that, you know, you could lock him in and say, oh, these guys are going to be on my team forever. I'm looking for the upside player, and when I looked at the Cardinals roster this offseason, I, I figured they'd be drafting a wide receiver, but not... Not one like Andy Isabella, because I felt like once Larry Fitzgerald retires, that it would make sense for Christian Kirk to go in the slot. It's not to say that he cannot play on the perimeter, but I feel like he's more of like a Golden Tate wide receiver. And Golden Tate, as you know, started his career on the perimeter mixed into the slot. I felt like that was going to happen. And now it's like Isabella, he can play on the perimeter too, but ideally you put him in the slot as a slippery guy that is just difficult for cornerbacks to keep up with or linebackers. You create mismatches. I wanted a perimeter wide receiver, a big body guy, a potential X receiver for the Arizona Cardinals. And I think Hakeem Butler is that guy. You know, we all know that he's only got one year of production in college and that that's basically the red flag on him. But he is one of the best ball trackers I have ever seen coming out of college. I feel like he's very well aware of his body. He knows how to time a ball. He knows how to track a ball over his shoulder in this vertical offense. If there's one player in this in this team that I can see after Larry Fitzgerald leaves being that, you know, that prototypical number one receiver, I think it's Akeem Butler. Again, he is not a locked in stud. Don't draft him and think that, oh, my God, Mike Tagliere said that he's going to be this. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is that <laughs> he has the potential to become that player in Cliff Kingsbury. I thought it was a, it, it was hilarious. Kingsbury passed him up in Texas Tech. Like, uh, so Hakeem Butler didn't receive an offer from them. And so Kingsbury called Hakeem Butler and said, I I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. We're taking you with this pick. And it's like, well, you made the mistake because you passed on him for the first three rounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still, I he did wind up on the team. And Hakeem Butler is, um, I think he's a steal. Like, if you can get him at the, the beginning of the second round. You know, Butler's number 13 ECR, so you had the better pick here according to the expert industry, but I'm really glad that you picked him because we're going to be doing a vote on Twitter. Again, we're at Bobby Fantasy Pro, at Mike Taglier NFL, and you're going to tell us who has the best team. We'll break down our teams at the end here. And since Tags picked Akeem Butler, I feel like I'm running away with this now because Henderson's the better pick, baby. Nah, I'll take Butler. I mean, I, I feel like running <laughs> backup running backs, I mean... We were talking about John Kelly last year as a guy that could potentially, now he might be cut from the roster. So it's like the backup running backs. They didn't trade up for him in the third round. I'm okay with backup running backs in the middle. 
end of the second round. But around here, it's like if I could find a receiver that could potentially be that game changer like Hakeem Butler, I'm taking him all day. All right, man. So ECR is taking JJ Arcega Whiteside and then Kyler Murray. That brings us up to pick 17. I already told you who I'm picking because he's still there. It's Irv Smith Jr. I think he's just a notch behind Hawkinson in terms of fantasy. And I've got him ahead of Noah Fant. Um, now, the landing spot is not ideal in Minnesota, so I bumped it behind Fant. I've got Fant at number 12. I've got Irv Smith Jr. at number 14. Irv Smith Jr., yeah, he's not going to play much this year. I mean, he'll play, but he's not going to do much. Fantasy owners will never start Irv Smith Jr. this year, not once. Yeah, no, this year you won't. Kyle Rudolph is in the last year of his contract. They're going to kind of groom Irv Smith Jr. to come into the offense after that. I like that. I'm good with Irv Smith Jr. I think he's... He's fine where he's at. Like, I, I mean, they have studs as wide receivers, so I don't know if Irv Smith is ever going to be, like, a stud tight end in fantasy. Kyle Rudolph's been fine, and Irv Smith Jr. is a much superior receiver than uh, than Kyle Rudolph. I would agree that he's a better, like, all-around player, but in terms of, like, touchdown upside, I think Kyle Rudolph, like, was severely underused by the the Vikings, actually. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to this pick. I feel like in the second round is where you kind of got to get your guys. And if you like Irv Smith a lot, grab him. All right. So he going with Andy Isabella so you can load up on Arizona Cardinals wide receivers. <laughs> Oddly enough, I am going to take Andy Isabella. He's actually right behind Butler on my, on my board. So like I mentioned, I don't think that he's like a number one receiver. I don't think I can find one of those guys on the board right now that, that has that upside. Uh, so I'm going to take Isabella who I compared to a Tyler Lockett. I think that that's the type of player I can see him as, uh, someone that can stretch the field probably going to max out around 90 targets like in a best case scenario maybe 100 but he's never going to be a 120 target guy but he can give you those big weeks from time to time hopefully you find you know lightning in a bottle and if you get Lockett then you can kind of like hopefully I would trade someone like that away like I think Lockett's stock is as high as it's going to be right now but Isabella in the second round it's like okay I'm not I'm not excited about it but I'm not mad at it. That's why I would have taken his well tag, so I'm not going to fall to there, of course. Uh, Justice Hill is right there for me as well. That's who ECR is taking. And then Damian Harris, who's with the Patriots. Who knows what's going to happen there? He's probably going to have three weeks this year where everybody plays him in DFS because he's somehow the starter and he's going to get 12 touchdowns in those weeks. Then we all forget about him eventually. Um, so on to pick 21, and I'm looking at the board. Devin Singletary in Buffalo? Nah. Kelvin Harmon in Washington. Miles Boykin in Baltimore. Jalen Hurd in San Francisco is interesting to me. I like Benny Snell. I could reach for Terry McLaurin here. Jay Sternberger even. I mean, there's a couple guys I like even further down that we'll get to eventually. But I'm going to go ahead and take Jalen Hurd right now because he won't be there next round. And I just like attaching myself to uh, to Shanahan. You know, I know you were a big Herd fan before the draft. Not even cool, dude. Not even cool. I liked him a lot. You can have this pick. I'll give you Jalen Hurd. Go ahead. No, it's yours. You have you take the guy you wanted. It's fine. I'm not happy about it, but I have to deal with it. Yeah. All right. So I'm taking Jalen Hurd, and now Tags will take an inferior player, and uh, we'll add him to the roster. <laughs> Um, so I'm looking at my big board in terms of like everybody else and like in with this, take Benny Snell, baby, take him with this ECR and, um, oh, man, I don't like what's on the board right now. Like Devin Slingletary is buried. I don't know what Buffalo's doing at running back. Cause like they're keeping McCoy. Apparently they're keeping Gore. They have TJ Yeldon and then Singletary who disappointed in the combine, but whatever. Um, he's another, he's a backup running back and I, oh man, I don't love this pick. But I'm going to go down and take someone who potentially could be the next Hunter Henry. Uh, I'm going to go Jay Sternberger. He's he's down the board a little bit. The ECR on him is 31. But I looking at the board, I feel like, you know, like the, here's the guys that are on the board for ECR right now. It's Devlin Singletary, Kelvin Harmon, who fell to the sixth round. Miles Boykin, who's the number two option in, in a Lamar Jackson-led offense. No, thank you. I love Jalen Hurd. I hated that you picked him because he would have been my pick 100%. Uh, and then you have Deontay Johnson, who's okay. Pittsburgh, that's fine. Uh, like he would have been an okay pick here. He's going to be fighting for snaps with uh, Dante Moncrief, and I think that tells you everything. He's great with the ball in his hands. Like maybe the best wide receiver in the whole class. Um, I don't know if I'd go that far. He's a solid player, but I, I felt like he went a little early. But it is what it is. Oh, big time! Yeah, he was like a fifth or sixth round pick, but putting him in Pittsburgh's offense with Big Ben, it's obviously solid. You know how I feel about Big Ben in terms of you know, where he stands historically, but he's a good quarterback and, and Antonio Brown's gone. If Johnson plays in the slot and they bump Juju outside, I think Johnson could be a, a quality rookie this year. Yeah. But I, I think that their idea is to keep Juju uh, in the role he's been in. I think that's the one he succeeded in and it'd be a mistake to move him around too much. Agree. But I do think they're going to bump him outside. Yeah. I think they have to a little bit more just because like, yeah, the personnel, but all right. So this is the first time that someone has 
quote unquote reach. Now, I, I agree. I've got Sternberger up there. I don't think it was a reach, but right now on the board, he's ECR 31. That means ECR is taking Devin Singletary and Kelvin Harmon, which leaves Miles Boykin on the board. Uh, with Deontay Johnson, Dwayne Haskins, Benny Snell, and you know I'm taking Benny Snell. Uh, I, first of all, I like him. I think that he can be a workhorse in this league. He's the backup. I get it, but he's the backup in an offense where backups have dominated, right? I mean, last year, James Conner, who knew if he was talented? Who knows if he really is all that talented? You do watch him play, and he's he's a good football player and everything, but it's the offense. It will always be the offense, and I want whoever's going to be in this offense, especially a guy that I like, Benny Snell. I get it. He's slow, but if he gets 20 touches a game, I'll take him. Yeah, Benny Snell, he went before I thought he was going to, and you know, when a team drafts him in the fourth round, it obviously says that they value him. So, I mean, he he moved up my board from when, basically, from when I had my pre-draft rankings to afterward, uh, knowing he landed in Pittsburgh, knowing they drafted him in the fourth round, he moved up. Um, I'm not a huge fan of him, but he is a workhorse, potentially, if James Conner goes down. All right, so who are you going with? Uh, it's not Miles Boykin. Um, I'm going to pass <laughs> on him again. Looking at my board, it's like I'm trying to debate whether or not I can get the player I want if I wait. Or just taking him here. You know what? Let's take Deontay Johnson. Uh, you know, you know, when we talk about the upside of some players, I'm going to go with him just because I know he won't be their next pick. And I think that there's another guy I might be able to get with my next one. Sure. Okay. I'm interested to see who that is. Hopefully I can snipe you on him. Uh, ECR is going to go ahead and take Miles Boykin and Dwayne Haskins. So we don't have to worry about that. If it was super flex, I would have taken Haskins, what, fourth, fifth overall? I mean, I, I have him behind Harry, Jacobs, Montgomery, and Paris Campbell. Yeah, and then you have Kyler Murray, who would bump him back further, and then Metcalf. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably put him at six or seven, I think, maybe, after thinking about it. And the other quarterbacks, where would you take them? Like 14, 15? Not in the first round, right? I think Daniel Jones deserves consideration because he's going to be like, they're they're going with him. You know, they're obviously sold on him. They're going to give him a long leash. Uh, I don't know if he starts this year. I think he does at some point. I think they have to. Um, But he's someone that deserves consideration, but I think he's more of like a second rounder. All right, so we are to pick 29. Rodney Anderson's on the board. Bryce Love. Riley Ridley, uh, Terry McLaurin is still there, so that's definitely who I'm taking. I've got him in, like in my teens. I don't know why he's ECR 32, but this is a really talented wide receiver with a great head on his shoulders, uh, not much competition in Washington. I saw somebody very respected in the industry, I wish I remembered who it was, say that Trey Quinn might lead this Washington team in, in targets this year, and he's right. There's just no competition, so I think McLaurin's going to find himself in the snaps right away. And he'll be solid. He'll be a good depth piece. Yeah, we, we found out that they're not picking up the option on Josh Doxson. No surprise there. Um, so Doxson will be gone after this year. Paul Richardson is there. I think people are forgetting a little bit about Paul Richardson. He was decent with the team. Um, but McLaurin, the, the fact, the reason that you want to like him a little bit more is because he's paired up again with Dwayne Haskins. You know, those two obviously just came out of college together. So there's already a rapport between those guys. And that's something you don't see very often, you know, going to the NFL. So maybe Washington knew that they wanted to pair those two together because McLaurin went sooner than people thought. And they they took him over Kelvin Harmon. I mean, it's it's very possible that McLaurin is like being undervalued right now. Yeah, I'm excited about this pick. So who are you going with? Is that did I take your guy? You didn't. I actually was able to get Rodney Anderson with this pick. Yeah, whatever. You know what? And it, this is another situation <laughs> where I'm taking the guy that was drafted after um, Travion Williams. But the way that I view these running backs, like, so Joe Mixon, obviously. Travion's never going to be a three down guy. Rodney Anderson definitely could. Yeah. I think that he's like that upside pick. So if Mixon goes down, because Mixon has had a couple injuries in his first two seasons. So if he goes down, I think Rodney Anderson is the handcuff. I think he's the one who walks into that role. And I think that Travion Williams is a long term Giovanni Bernard replacement. So he's going to have a role and Bernard's going to be gone after this year if they don't cut him. Um, but I happen to think. I happen to think that Rodney Anderson is the more value commodity here. And I think that he's like my comp to him. Like, I'm not going to say he's Arian Foster, but that's the type of running back I I'm reminded of when I watch Rodney Anderson. That's the type like a player he can be. He's very, he, he's just very, he, he, I don't know. He just doesn't, he's not moving like fast all the time, but he just, he's very smooth in his movements and he's not afraid of contact, but he's always hurt. <laughs> that's the downside. So, um, there's pros and cons with him, but getting him here, you know, at the end of the second round, I'm fine with. You know, a lot of people are going to hear that and they're going to say, come on, you can't compare someone like that to Rodney Anderson. Guys, how many times have we seen like a, you know, a fifth, sixth round pick? Arian Foster was undrafted. How many times have we seen these guys become superstars? It's just the type of runner you are, the opportunity you get, the scheme that you're in. People become better. 
this is a good, Rodney Anderson's a good athlete. If he gets in the right situation in Cincinnati, they build up their offensive line. Absolutely. He's got upside and he's got more upside than someone like Trayvon Williams, who's limited in what he can accomplish. Yep. I am right there with you. Um, yes. All right, man. Bryce Love, Riley Ridley are now off the board. ECR took them. We're to pick 33. Travion Williams is there. Drew Locke, Daniel Jones, Alexander Madison. I'm going to go ahead and reach, though. And you better not even get any ideas about taking my next guy either because I have two guys I really want here. This one, Reichwell Armstead, welcome to the team. Back up for Leonard Fournette. Let's go, baby. That's a good one. I, I like that pick a lot. And he actually would have been right there in the conversation for my next pick, yeah. Uh, he actually would have been. Uh, looking at my board, he would have been the next pick. I didn't realize that Bryce Love went off the board, but he did. Take that, sucker. Yeah. So, <laughs> Sorry, man. So why why do you like Armstead? I mean, I just feel like he's a, he's a phenomenal backup to Leonard Fournette, who has off-the-field concerns. You know, like, the, they're not suspending him for anything. It was a you know, traffic violation or whatever. Well, that and the coaching staff hates him. But Leonard Fournette, like, my issue with him, like, I love Leonard Fournette, the player. Like, I loved him coming out of college, and there was nobody higher than him. And I still think that he's extremely talented. I think he's, like... I don't think he's all there mentally yet. Like I think him in Pittsburgh instead of James Conner. Can you imagine the stats he would put up? I mean, Jacksonville was missing four of their five offensive linemen last year. Yeah. Now they added Juwan Taylor to it and like they're going to be healthy. So I think that Leonard Fournette first off is being extremely undervalued, but he's not all there in terms of like maturity level. So there's, there's definitely possibility that Reichwell Armstead finds his way onto the field just because Fournette's, you know, bonehead at times. So Fournette's definitely a superior player, but I think Armstead is one of those guys that's like, you got late, and it's like, he has a chance to play this year. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, if you had to project how many games Leonard Fournette's going to miss over under four and a half. <laughs> I'm going to say under just because I don't ever want to like rely on that, but I'll say, I'll say under. I know, but that's who he is, man. Like, it happens. And I don't know if Armstead is the direct backup, but of all those guys they've got, they signed a bunch of crummy running backs. If Alfred Blue's the backup, I would be surprised. Of all the guys they've got, Armstead could be the three-down guy. By the way, did you see? I, I We missed this somehow. At least I did. The Jets picked up Chris Conley, my dude. Yeah, they did. They have all the speed they want, but Nick Foles throwing them the ball. But no football players either. They've got all the athletes, no football players. They do. All the athletes. I, I, I did see that, and it's it was meh. <laughs> okay, so who are you taking? Reichwell Armstead's off the board, or you just want to quit right now? <laughs> I'm not going to quit right now. <laughs> uh, I am going to, uh, I, I'm debating someone, but I'm going to, I'll wait on him and see if he's there. He won't be. I'm taking him. I'm going to go ahead and take Emmanuel Hall. That's a great pick. See, I would, I would have taken him next round if my guy wasn't going to be there, but he definitely is because I know who I'm getting. Nice. Uh, so Emmanuel Hall, like he went undrafted and I don't really know why. Uh, but the Bears, that was one of the first undrafted free agents to sign with a team, was Hall. I feel like he's like the Taylor Gabriel potential replacement. I took a look at, I'm, I have an article coming out tomorrow morning, uh, talking about the risers and fallers from the, after the NFL draft in terms of veterans and, you know, um, the players that are already on rosters and what happened, who gained stock, who lost it. And one of those players that lost stock, I feel like was Taylor Gabriel. Gabriel, they signed a four year big contract with the Bears last year, but after this year, they can release him and only take a $2 million cap hit. So it's really nothing. Looking at Riley Ridley, yes, he was drafted before Emmanuel Hall. Um, he was drafted in the fourth round, but Riley Ridley is not going to, they're not going to have Allen Robinson, Riley Ridley, and Anthony Miller out there. There's nobody to stretch the field in that case. So Emmanuel Hall is more of like the guy that could take Taylor Gabriel's place. And Emmanuel Hall is a better version. Like, I feel like Emmanuel Hall, I compared him to Mike Wallace. I still stand by that. And I think Emmanuel Hall was one of those guys that was kind of miffed that he didn't get drafted and, and he'll take it out. I think that he made Drew Locke better not the other way around. So I think Emmanuel Hall was underrated, so I'll take him with the upside play. That's a good pick, man. I really like that one. That takes Trayvon Williams off the board, Drew Locks off the board. That leaves us with Daniel Jones, Alexander Madison, and now Mike Weber is in the picture. And I don't understand this because Mike Weber was taken by Dallas in the seventh round. My guy, Pollard, was taken in the fourth round. He's the backup to Ezekiel Elliott. That's who I want. I'm taking Pollard, man. Pollard is weird. Like, I don't know how to feel about him. Like, yes, they drafted him in the fourth round, but he's more of like a Tony Pollard, by the way. Yeah. Like, I just, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not upset with that pick. Like, you're looking for lightning in a bottle in terms of drafting a backup running back for Dallas. I think I'd prefer Mike Weber, but knowing that, you know, the fourth and seventh round thing, I just think that they have a different role. It's kind of like Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones, right? Aaron Jones is the better player. Mike Weber is the better player. But who got the first crack? Jamal Williams. Right. Yeah. He definitely did. So that's, it's possible. All right. So who are you going with? I'm going to take the guy that I thought about last round, and that's Alexander Madison. Uh, the Vikings basically said, uh, we're not happy with the guys that we have behind Dalvin Cook, 
And we're going to take Madison in the third round. That's before I thought he was going to go. A lot of people liked him in the draft process. And now Rock Thomas is in trouble. So maybe Madison passes up uh, Mike Boone for the number two. Yeah, I think he does immediately. Drafting him in the third round, that's a lot of equity. I mean, didn't they get Dalvin Cook in the second round? It just sucks because Mike Boone is the greatest football player alive and he will never <laughs> get a chance. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just looking at like a handcuff here. And it's a situation they upgraded their offensive line a little bit. Dalvin Cook has been, you know, dealing with injuries throughout his NFL career. So I think Madison is one of the better handcuffs. Okay, so that leaves uh, Daniel Jones is taken. Uh, you took Madison. Mike Weber is now off the board. Top guys on the board for me at the next round. Keyshawn Johnson, Darwin Thomas, Dexter Williams, Will Greer. You know what? I'm going to go way down before you get the same idea. ECR number 72. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm taking the guy that's highest on my board. It's Elise Mack. Tight end for the New Orleans Saints. Drew Brees loves tight ends. Elise Mack was a former number one tight end recruit uh, in high school, and he didn't really shine at Notre Dame. It's not the best offense for tight ends. You put him in Iowa, man, this guy has a first. He's a first round talent. He really is. We'll see what happens. He's a little bit raw, but I think eventually uh, Drew Brees is probably going to play three or four more years with the way he's going. He just had maybe his best season of all time. If Elise Mack can get into this, uh, you know, the top of that depth chart next year, maybe by the end of the year with injuries, I think we're going to see just how athletic he is. Pretty crazy. Uh, ben Watson reportedly wants to come back. I guess we'll see. And Jared Cook is not very good. So uh, that pick, it was a little bit of a reach, but he's not he's not that far down my board from where we're at. I think I, I was just worried you were going to take him because I had to have him. I think I have like seven players still on my board ahead of him, but he's higher than the consensus. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, so who are you going with? Darwin Thompson is my pick here. Excellent receiving back out of the backfield for the Kansas City Chiefs. They didn't take him till late in the draft, so I don't think that he's like going to overtake Damian Williams or anything. But I mean, who cares? Who who cares what he can do, what his talent is, what his combat metrics were? Just say this. He plays in an Andy Reid's offense, so he's got upside. There you go, and they drafted him. So it, yeah. <laughs> if Damian Williams goes down, you know, whatever, I, I, Carlos Hyde is obviously still there. But we saw the same thing happen with Damian Williams. Damian Williams was considered a pass-catching running back. And look at him now. Yep. Yep. You're right. All right, man. So uh, Keyshawn Johnson's gone. And since you took Darwin Thompson, that means Dexter Williams is gone, which was going to be my pick. And I'm mad at you. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm still just absolutely whooping you. I just need to figure out who I want with my last pick now. Why don't you go ahead and make yours since you know who I want? And uh, and then we'll call it even since you got the first pick one round. Oh, let's see. Who do I want? That's still on the board. All right. You ran out of time. It's my pick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. I don't think Will Greer has much upside. He's my QB5, but that's in super flex leagues. I think someone who has a chance to be an actual, not the QB1, but a QB1 at some point in his career is Jared Stidham. We've talked about him before. Uh, he's going to be playing in Bill Belichick's offense. We've seen, what's his name, Matt Castle excel, winning 12, 13 games. I think that Bill Belichick is going to stay around after Brady retires. And he's going to get his. So I'm going to take Stidham here with my 12th and final pick. Stidham's cool. I, I'm, I'm not mad at that pick. I, I, I mean, I, I kind of like it. If you're in a super flex, he's like a guy that you could stick on your roster and hope that he sticks. Uh, maybe the next Garoppolo that people are like, oh, he's going to be the next one. Or blah. I'm just going to do what I do. And uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take <laughs> another player from the same team. I'm going to go with James Williams running back from Kansas City. So basically, I have both running backs that they wound up on the roster James Williams reminds me a lot of James White. Obviously not as talented as James White, but another pass-catching running back that is just on the Kansas City depth chart. And getting him this late in the fourth round, I'm, I'm fine with that. Like, he's just a guy that I'll have in my roster, and we'll see. If he makes the team, obviously I'll keep him. Usually in fourth rounders, these are guys that might not even make the team. So somebody could argue and say Hunter Renfro should be drafted here um, because he's going to probably start in a slot for the Raiders, but I'm just not a fan. Go for the upside. Go for that upside late in drafts. I like the call. Final picks in the draft, ECR takes Will Greer, and then running back from Seattle, Travis Homer. So tags, let's share our teams. I think I missed one of your picks, so you'll have to fill me in on who I'm missing here. All right, so here's your team. Coach without a mustache, Josh Jacobs, DK Metcalf, TJ Hawkinson, Hakeem Butler, Jay Sternberger, Deontay Johnson. It's looking good. I like your picks. Andy Isabella, that's a good one. Rodney Anderson, Alexander Madison. Emmanuel Hall, Darwin Thompson, and James Williams. Tags, I like your draft a lot. Out of the four teams in this league, you're definitely going to be a solid second. <laughs> Go ahead. Rattle off your team. All right. Here's my team. Top Golf Championship coach, Nikhil Harry, Paris Campbell, Miko Hardman, Daryl Henderson, Irv Smith Jr., Jalen Hurd, Benny Snell, Terry McLaurin, 
Reichwell Armstead, Tony Pollard, Elise Mack, and Jared Stidham. I like mine better, obviously. <laughs> no, there's players on yours that's like if, if something happens, if like an injury happens, I think your guys would. And I, th- I felt like I took guys that might not require an injury to get there. Yeah, that that's just a difference in philosophy. I've got some upside guys. You've got guys who seem more fit to naturally fall into the depth chart over time. So we'll see how it plays out. Tags, this was a lot of fun. You guys can tell us what you think on Twitter at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Taglier NFL. Let us know who won, even though we already know the answer <laughs> and we're going to put up a poll. Mike, this was fun, buddy. It was, dude. It was, it was it was fun doing these rookie drafts. It's like I know a lot of people in Dynasty are getting excited about these. And this is the season, you know, in May and June where you're going to see a lot of rookie drafts. So uh, if you do have any questions about what we did, you know, just like, like Bobby said, hit us up on Twitter. Yep. All right, guys. And we've got more episodes coming up. I think we're kicking it up to two episodes per week here pretty soon. But make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future podcasts. Also, you can check out our YouTube channel again. It's youtube.com slash fantasy pros. You'll see me with an Antonio Brown golden mustache here in a little bit. For Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.